God bless you, veterans. We celebrate you today, your willingness to serve for our freedom. Thank you very much. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to hold our Bibles up high. Welcome all of you watching online. Join us and say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what the Bible says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God, and I boldly confess my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and I will never be the same again. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, for those of you who uh, weren't here uh, last week, we began a new series entitled True North, and uh, it simply means that in our lives as Christians, Christ is our true north, and uh, that he is the pull on our lives that gives direction to our lives. And um, I've watched this video I want to show you just briefly. I watched it several times, and it's so moving. Um, you could tell if someone is pointed true north. Now, when I say this, please don't miss this. Um, not every one of us, if any of us, maintain a true north life. It's our goal to constantly be pointing that direction and moving that direction. But how many of you know there are days that go south? And uh, so much of our life is, is, is directed by the words we speak, the people we're around, the circumstances we encounter, the difficulties that confront us. All of those things challenge the compass of our soul to stay true to God. I've been in hospital rooms, funerals where, you know, people question where's God, and, and, and that's okay. I, I've never been offended by that. My response is just typically this. He's in the same place he was when his son was crucified. Uh, it's all I know to say because it's not like God has left us or abandoned us. It's just that rain falls on the just and unjust and in the midst of that you, that's why you have to have a compass there are dark times in life that you just need something to help give direction to where you're going from where you are and what you're going through that you go through and uh, I, I've never met this man but I really like him and it's one of the most energizing videos I've ever watched so just endure if you don't like it and if you don't, I'm not real sure that you're breathing. So, I mean, it's it's that good. I in jest I say that. So, Jaden, go ahead and run this. Steve Harvey. If I had the pleasure of bringing out Christ, this is just how I would do it. It ain't got to be the way you do it. You might not think it's just right, but this is how I would do it. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce a man who needs no introduction. His credits are too long to list. He has done the impossible time after time. He hailed out of a manger in Bethlehem, Jerusalem, by way of heaven. His daddy is the author of a book that has been on the bestseller list since the beginning of time. He fed 5,000 hungry souls with two fish, five loaves of bread. He can walk on water, turn water into wine. No special effects, no camera tricks. He was hailed the king of all kings, ruler of the universe, alpha and omega, beginning and the end, the bright and the morning star. Get up on your feet, put your hands together. And show your love for the second coming of the one and only. God has been good. <laughs> yeah. What an introduction. Um, that is what I call, the reason I'm show, I showed that, is that is true north conviction, passion, and uh, immovable, not questionable, not arguable. Uh, I would not want to have an argument with Steve Harvey. I can just tell you that right now. He'd be one of the last guys on earth I'd want to debate. Uh, and it's amazing because his voice is being heard in celebrity circles that would not, circles that would not hear us. And uh, 
we're living in a day where those are the kinds of words that people need to hear and the kind of passion that they need to feel when we talk about Jesus. And uh, True North is uh, a very difficult place to stay. It's a challenge to walk that way. It requires that we use biblical principles, biblical knowledge to make decisions, uh, not emotions, but that we decide ahead of time how we're going to live our lives. If you don't get up every day and I don't get up every day and we don't get up every day with this commitment to say, God, this is the day you've made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. There will be plenty of reasons not to rejoice. Uh, circumstances being what they may in everyone's life. I, I got a message uh, just this week, precious couple that that I've been their pastor for longer than I can remember, and uh, they own a business, and they've just I've watched them grow and and uh, throughout the years, probably 25 plus years, and uh, had a it got got back in church here at Mosaic. They've been out for a while and a few years, and and uh, they and they're just really great people. Uh, she had an incident uh, that she fell through a, their ceiling in 20 feet onto the floor, all kinds of mess, surgery and everything. And, and here they were just, you know, three, four weeks back into church and just like the devil to come and try to steal, kill, and destroy. And so we had the opportunity to interact with them and talk to them before surgery. Surgery came out better than they thought it would. So good things are happening. But with that said, uh, there are times that we have crises in our lives that really, uh, it, it really throws us off. And, and we start our, the needle on our compass starts spinning and going, how do I get out of this? What do I do? What I, well, the, the, what I would say to you is say what you want, not what you are. Say what you desire, not what you're going through. This is where you, you just commit, as Job said, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. Now, he wasn't saying God slays anybody, but he's saying if he did, how would you respond? Because bad things happen to good people, and good things happen to bad people. And we're constantly trying to reconcile how this thing called Christianity works based on what we see in the world and what we see in our lives and not what we see in the Word. And the Word is what we're looking to, uh, looking to, to guide us. It's our compass, our focal point. And uh, in Proverbs 3, 5, out of the particular trans, this, the Passion Translation, I love it. It says, trust in the Lord completely and do not rely on your own opinions. How many of you know opinions will get you in trouble? And oftentimes, our opinions are driven by how somebody treats us, taps into our emotions, and, and, and we start feeling things. And when we start feeling things without checking those things through our mind and his word and our thoughts, those things will carry us places we don't want to go. And so we start moving based on our opinion of things instead of knowing what Jesus said. No weapon formed against me will prosper. Every tongue that rises up against me will be refuted. And though my enemies come at me from one direction, they'll flee in seven. Those are the kinds of things that we have to target to stay true north because there are times the winds will blow and they'll come hard against us and start trying to move us in the direction of, of turmoil, tragedy, difficulty. And before you know it, we're, we're going with it. Uh, there was a time I was uh, doing a, uh, a, a TV program at Notre Dame and it, it was on campus there and, and uh, I was doing a little traveling and and so uh, a friend of mine had this King Air airplane, and he's in, in Munster, Indiana. And so he said, well, I can just get my pilot to fly you over there and fly you back, and you won't have to drive. It'd save you hours. And I said, sounds good. So get up in the morning, and, and um, we go to the, the studio. He drops me off, and, and I do the program. And when I come out, he tells me, he said, now, the, weather, the weather's not real good. That's not what you want to hear when you're flying a small plane. And I said, well, it would be okay. See, so, yeah, I will make it. That's not what you want to hear. Uh, so sure enough, we're, we're, we're flying from uh, there at the Notre Dame campus, leaving there, and, and we're coming in to south of Chicago. It's just right across the line from Illinois into Indiana. And I'm telling you, I 
didn't want to pray. I wanted to cuss. I mean, I'm I, I, the pilot. I mean, literally, I'm looking straight out. The plane is sideways. I'm yelling at him. I, I'm not even being nice. I said, you have got to straighten this thing out and get us in some air that is going to be compatible with my faith. And it was shaking my compass. <laughs> it was shaking my true north. It was shaking me knowing that, that God was with us. But in that moment, how many of you know your emotions and the fear that starts trying to grasp you? If, if my true north should have been, I'll sleep. And if I wake up in heaven, that's great. If I don't wake up on earth, that's okay. I'm going to tell you, that shatters the devil. When he cannot get you to get afraid and downcast and all in the mully grubs, that's a Berry Hill term. When he can't get you there, you are true north. You are unshakable. You no longer have an opinion. Look, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That is a true North statement, and we have to keep saying that. Many people say they get, start getting afraid of dying and getting older, and, and uh, I just look and say, man, I am like 28 between my ears. Now, it takes my body 28 minutes to get out of bed in the morning and, and, and get the cracks and all of the, the stuff, you know, all the snap, crackle, pop, Rice Krispies out of me. But I still between my ears, and guess what? Between your ears, the most important thing you've got in your life. How you think is how you're going to live. And, and yeah, you know what? Yeah, there. I, I tell people, I said, I can do everything right now that I did at 30. It just takes me three days instead of three minutes to recover. <laughs> I said, so I celebrate because I, I can do that. So I could, I could complain about the lack of response that I have now as compared to when I was younger, or I can say, thank God I can still respond. And so you have to look, intentionally look, to keep the compass where it belongs. I mean, it is a battle driving. It's a battle at work. It's a battle at the grocery store. Everywhere we go, we're surrounded by a diverse variety of people. Some agree with us, some don't, some are nice, some aren't. And, and we have to really be intentional. Like, if you go to the grocery store and, and, and the, the clerk that's ringing you up, which now, now this is just a sidebar. I hate going through uh, my own checkout, checking my own stuff out for two reasons. One is I'm paying the same price and I'm doing the work. Number two reason I hate it is I'm taking somebody's job. So I think we ought to boycott self-checkout. I mean, that's just my emotion or my opinion. But I'm just saying, you see what I'm saying? All these different ideas of this looks like a great idea. Is it really a great idea? And we can get sideways if somebody else's opinion doesn't align itself with ours. True North to me is constantly battling that idea of if somebody doesn't agree with me, that's okay. My goal in life is not to get you to agree with me. My goal in life is to keep me in agreement with God. Keeping in agreement with the Word. Keeping in agreement with, with the Holy Spirit. That's our job in life. And it's so easy for somebody to dethrone the Holy Spirit, to dethrone Jesus during the day by getting our attention, uh, uh, attention and our opinion being twisted and changed by what's going on around us instead of focusing on what's going on in us. And it goes on to say, With all your heart, rely on Him to guide you, and he will lead you in every decision you make. Become intimate with him in whatever you do. And he will lead you wherever you go. And that's a key word, intimate with God. A, a guy I knew wrote a book. And, and he's a great guy. And, and I have nothing bad to say about him. But it was called God Chasers. And uh, I pondered that book. It was a really great seller way back, you know, a couple of decades ago or whatever. Or maybe three. It's been a long time. And I pondered that for years. And I went, hold it, hold it. God's chasing me. How's your wife? That's who I was talking about. She better be good. God's going to raise her up. God's raising her up better than ever. And so what, I, what I've come to realize is in my life, I have to really focus 
in order to stay north with God. And Eric is here staying north while his wife's getting healed. That's north living. And I've watched this couple fight, fight, fight through more stuff than I could tell you, and I'm proud of you. I'm telling you, man, it's, it's not easy. But here he is. And I'm telling you, if anybody, I've never known a woman tougher than your wife. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now. The devil picked on the wrong person. That's ceiling. Nah. So here he is, and I promise you she's watching, listening, or something, because they said we're committed to Jesus. And that's how come used to you, you measured people's commitment. And I, as a pastor, this is difficult to say sometimes, but you measure it by, by sometimes church, and, and I think we ought to be in church, but I know a lot of people who aren't that love Jesus. So our goal as a church, our, our north, extreme north, true north, is to keep loving everybody. That's what we do. That's who we are. That's what Mosaic is. And, and so we take everyone that comes in here as a broken piece, plug them into the picture God is, is, is painting in this church. And so it takes a, an intimacy with God that says, God, I want more than anything to please you. That's my heart's desire. I mean, every now and then somebody will say something that I want to have a response to. Hey, listen, you don't have to open your mouth every time you want to. I have gotten myself in more trouble than anyone should ever get into because I always have a remark. My name is Mark, and I have a remark. It's terrible, you know, to have that kind of strong, so strong of an opinion. But it goes on to say, don't think for a moment that you know it all. For wisdom comes when you adore him with undivided devotion and avoid everything that's wrong. Then you will find the healing refreshment your body and spirit long for. Glorify God with all your wealth, honoring him with your first fruits, with every increase that comes to you. Now, again, looking at this saying, what, what is, you, you've got true north relationally, how you treat people will tell how true north we are. Um, because people are the greatest challenge. And there are times you're the greatest challenge, I'm the greatest challenge. <laughs> There, there are times, and, and so we have to create this relational intimacy with God to deal with relationships, intimacy financially. God, I trust you uh, with, with my finances. Uh, I trust you with everything I have. Um, true north is I'm going to obey God in every aspect, every detail of my life. I'm going to walk in obedience to God. Now, do I do that? Probably not. Do I want to? Is that my focus? Is that my true north? It's constantly fighting to keep pointed in that direction. And here's the reality. There will always be people, intentionally or unintentionally, that will try to get you to move your compass. Well, it, you know, it's okay. And, you know, and some people will come up. And if they're really mature Christians, here's what they do. If they want to talk about somebody, here's what they do. We need to pray for Bobby. Now you're getting set up. Let me tell you every detail why we need to pray for him. And it goes from being a prayer to a gossip session. And so, but mature Christians get this. Oh, I'm not talking about him. I just think you need to know how to pray 30 minutes later. You don't need every detail to pray for somebody. Hey, they're not well. You don't need to know what they have or don't have. Sometimes it's embarrassing to tell somebody what you have. And so just, can you just pray for him? My health needs prayer. That's it. You don't have to go into detail. And so we have to not be swayed by negative people, people who are doubtful, people who are fearful, because they're everywhere. And, and I don't listen to fear, and I don't listen to doubt. And so in, in the book of Galatians, one of my favorite books, the Apostle Paul's dealing with issues in Galatia, and he says, you crazy Galatians. This is how the, the, the Message Bible did someone put a hex on you? Have you taken leave of your senses? Something crazy has happened, for it's obvious that you no longer have the crucified Christ in clear focus in your lives. 
the crucified Christ in clear focus. In other words, it, it, it'd be as bad as having some kind of ungodly eye situation where you can't see clearly. Uh, and, and you got like major cataracts or something. And I tell you, I've had cataract surgery. It is wonderful. I can see, which you better not mess up. I can see you clearly. But I couldn't see clearly. I had to wear glasses, and at night, a, a, a headlight looked like a concert light. And, you know, it was unclear. It was scary. You don't want to ride with me. And so once I got it cleared up, everything I can see clearly. Well, once we get committed to the Bible and, and to the Word of God, and, and we stay in tune with that, we won't be crazy. We'll say, hold it. I, I know true north, and you pulled out in front of me, but I'm quickly going to come back after I honk. His sacrifice on the cross was certainly set before you clearly enough. Let me put this question to you. How did your new life begin? Was it by working your heads off to please God? Or was it by responding to God's message to you? Are you going to continue this craziness? For only crazy people would think they could complete by their own efforts what was begun by God. I don't know how many of you had this aha moment when you got born again. I had an aha moment when I got born again. I mean, it was radical. I was one of these people that got radically saved. It wasn't like, well, I think I'll, I think I'll give God a chance. It was like, I'm going to hell quick if I don't get this turned around. And so when I got really born again, I, I was so radical probably that the, the pendulum swings typically from extremely lost to extremely religious. And, and I became that, which was better than being extremely lost. Hello? But I tried by my own good works, which was all I knew at the time. I didn't know how the Holy Spirit worked. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know what he was here to do. So I just followed a pattern of, of what I had heard. I didn't have the Bible in me. I had it around me, but I didn't have it in me. I had no intimacy with God. In other words, I was following the compass of man, the compass of religion. Uh, do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. And it wasn't that any of them were horrible. But how many of you know the letter of the law kills, but the Spirit gives life? And so if you're trying to follow the letter of the law and you've never been introduced intimately to the Holy Spirit, it will be a long, miserable religious journey because you're constantly measuring yourself against your behavior or the behavior of others. True North says, I'm measuring my life against this. Love never fails. Love at all times. Grace triumphs here. We got grace over sin. We got mercy over judgment. So if God is showing me grace that I don't deserve, giving me mercy that I should be judged for, then what am I called to do? This is my true North. And, you know, I hear people say all the time, one and done. You mess me over once and I'm done. Well, you know, I don't really see that biblically I understand that humanly where you say you know once shame on you twice shame on me and uh but and there are boundaries in life but even with boundaries we never give up on people if I distance myself some, some from someone it doesn't mean I don't love them it may mean that I don't have the capacity to address their behavior or to tolerate their behavior. Doesn't make them bad people. I often tell people, I said, you know, it's, it's, I cannot do this. I don't have the capacity right now. And so I create a boundary in my life to protect you, protect me, protect us. It's very, very important. That, because it's very easy to blame other people for where you're not and what you don't have. And why you are where you are. That is not true north. That is turning south, trying to find... The reason for the problem, and most people spend their whole life, came, I wonder why they treated me that way or why life turned out this way instead of turning north and saying, it's not going to be that way anymore. What the devil meant for harm, God's going to turn for good. My footsteps are ordered by him. Right now it doesn't look like it, but I'm telling you, I'm not going to deviate from one opinion to another. When I was first cutting my teeth in Christianity and trying to learn this thing called the Bible and how the Spirit of God moved and I came in contact with a couple that, that uh, had lost a child. 
at, at childbirth and and uh and, and this was during probably the 80s with the extreme faith movement. And somebody came in and said, okay, uh, what, what sin did you commit to cause this to happen? True story. And, and it was because you didn't have enough faith. You didn't do the right thing. So you see what I'm saying? That, that'll turn you south quick. And if you ain't real saved, that'll break somebody's nose real quick. See, because th this kind of thing happens in a fallen world that you had nothing to do with it. You were not a part of the problem. You are not the problem. And, and so, but, but the devil wants to convince us and he'll send people along like he did to the people at Galatia to try to twist their thinking away from the crucified Christ. This is why we have to stay intimate with God in meditation, in prayer, in church attendance, in worship. This is the reason, not so we can go to heaven, but so that we can overcome hell on earth. And so we have, to, we have to fight the good fight instead of saying, why did this happen to me? Well, you know, most of the time, nobody can explain why it happened to you. I can't explain why something happens to me. I can't. And every now and then, people come and remind me of my, my journey along the way. And my simple response is, if God wanted to stop that, he could. That, now, this is the way I get through it. I'm not saying I'm, I'm theologically accurate. But I'm saying for me, I have to say, well, if God's really God, and I really believe he is, then it's okay. I don't question that. I have to look and say, God, I, I'm, I'm here for a reason. I don't know what the reason is, but I know this. I'm going to grow through that reason. I'm going to grow through this crisis. I'm going to advance while the enemy's trying to hold me back. I'm going to live my best life. And it's not going to depend on the circumstances that favor me. It depends on the God who saved me. And circumstances oftentimes get our needle in our compass talking. People go, I can't believe that happened to you. I can't believe that. What did you do? What did you do wrong? How did this happen? And we, they start talking about things that none of us have any knowledge of. We don't know. We just know that it's absolutely true living in a fallen world around fallen people who hate God, or are indifferent about God, and even ourselves questioning things about God, things happen. And we have to turn our focus back to him. That is the true north. And so when I think about this, I think about the story of Joseph who's had a dream from God. It was, it was from God. And he's young, and his brothers are out in the field working. His father loved him. He's this young brother of all these. And He's close to God. He's intimate with God. And he's, he has this dream about his brothers bowing before him and all of this. And Joseph doesn't know. He just goes out and, and opens his mouth and tells his brothers about the dream. Well, how many of you know when you start telling people they're going to bow down to you, it usually doesn't go well. You immediately start making enemies when you elevate yourself above other people. And it's understandable. Our human nature is we all want to be as important as everybody else. And we all want to be perceived that in that fashion. And so Joseph finds himself, finally his brothers are so mad at him that first off they want to kill him. And so one brother finally speaks up knowing that's not going to happen. And they decide to throw him in a pit. Now, what do you do when you get in a pit? You scream out, you cry out, you cuss out. I don't know what you do. But metaphorically, every one of us has been in a pit. At some point in our life, we've been in a pit. And so Joseph has no control over what's going to happen next. He doesn't know what's going to happen next. And finally, one brother convinces him there's this this body of people traveling along. They said, let's sell him. Wow, you got to love siblings. And you would think, based on this part of the story, that Joseph's life, as he has known it, is over. Listen, if you do the right thing in the pit, it's possible you can end up in the palace. If you don't do the right thing in the pit, and you don't stay true north, you'll go south just like everybody else. And too often we follow the crowd instead of the voice of God. We think that it, the majority rules. The majority doesn't rule. God rules. And the only time the majority rules is if 
we determine that they are the rulers. And we join company with people who would disagree with us. You see, there will always be people while you're in your pit that will go on living their life like nothing happened. And if you wait your whole life for them to come back and apologize, you'll be miserable most of your whole life. And so a part of the pit is not ordained by God. You can think Joseph could have been in the pit going, all I did was tell them about what you told me. All I did was let them in on what was going to happen. Now, Joseph didn't have the end of the dream or how the dream was going to be played out. But he just simply said, this is the dream I had. And he was a dreamer, and he could interpret dreams. And Joseph was this man of God, and his brothers are irritated because here this young brother is telling them, you're going to serve me. What they didn't know, which I'll get to in a moment, was that it was going to benefit them. Let me tell you, some of the things that you think are not going to help you out or benefit you are the very things that God is going to use to get you what you need. But we have to let God be God. True North says, I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. I belong to you. So whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do it. And oftentimes God will tell us to do things that are not compatible with how we feel or the opinions we have. Like God will say, I want you to go and I want you to repent before that person. Well, they need to repent to me. Have you ever had that feeling? I'm like, I'm not going to apologize. I don't know anybody in apology. What does it cost you to apologize to somebody? Nothing. Except your pride. And pride comes before the fall. So what we have to do is yield, stop, pause, whatever you want to say, and say, God, I'm going to be so true north that whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do it. Wherever you tell me to go, I'm going to go. My friend who pastors a church in Victoria, Texas, Grew up in a Catholic home in Pennsylvania, very strong Catholic family. And one day, he was a great athlete, and somebody led him to the Lord. And you say, well, he was Catholic. He didn't know Jesus. He just knew Catholicism. Now, inside of Catholicism, there are people who know Jesus, so don't hear me say Catholics don't know Jesus. That's not what I'm saying. But many Catholics don't know Jesus, just like many other denominations, people are there, but they don't know Jesus. They know that they come to church to socialize. That's great. They come to church to be around other people. They come to church because movie tickets are too expensive and it's free here. It's a place to go. So my friend realizes I've been Catholic my whole life. I'm in high school now, and all of a sudden I know I, I, I've, I've accepted Christ. And he goes home and tells his family he's all excited they weren't excited. He had met true north. The needle and the compass went from religion to relationship. And, and his family rejected him and ultimately kicked him out of his house. But, long story short, kind of like Joseph, he stayed true north. They threw him in a pit, if you will. And he stayed true north, kept serving God. He ended up going to a Christian university, leading his entire family to Jesus over time. You see, sometimes your pit has a purpose. If not all the time, it has a purpose. Our response to that purpose has to come through an intimate relationship with Jesus, understanding that I don't understand why God is doing this or allowing this to happen. But I do know this, no matter what the outcome is, I'm going to serve the Lord. That's true north. Because people will wrong you. People will, and, and it, like I said, it doesn't mean you have to be around them. If, if you have, don't have a capacity at this point, if it brings out poison in you, then stay away. And, and uh, don't, don't, let, don't take that in. Remove it from your life so that it doesn't get into your life. It happens throughout the Bible all the time. You see people separating, coming back together after a time. And, and we have to be responsible to, to do that. It says, so it came to pass, when Joseph had come to his brothers, they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors, the coat of many colors is what we've heard growing up. And then they took him east, into a, uh, cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty and there was no water in it. So we have to stay focused on the promise or we will become pit of full. 
Do you realize a lot of people love attention so much that when they get pitiful, they get attention, and they never know how to get out of it because now somebody's talking to them. How many of you know people respond to suffering people more than they do successful people? Successful people are usually create jealousy. Pitiful people create attention because now if you're pitiful and I'm just barely pitiful, I'm superior to you. So we have levels of pitiful. And so it, it, in some people, and I had this conversation with my brother recently when I was uh, in junior high school. My brother was a senior going into his senior year, got hit by a truck on a motorcycle. They were pretty sure he was going to die. And uh, multiple surgeries in the hospital, I don't know how many months. And as a result, my mom and dad, he was the firstborn, he's the oldest child. And, and uh, it, they thought they had lost him. God miraculously put him back together. And he's alive today. I don't know how. He's had more surgeries than I can count. But we were talking the other day, and this is public knowledge, and he wouldn't be mad at me for telling you, but he said, you know, I think I, I, I think that really was a turning point, not in a good way for me, because he was pitiful. It was pitiful. Here he is, senior year, and uh, he has a, a plate in his left calf or down in his bottom part of his leg, a pin in the top, I mean, all kinds of stuff. He can't go through a metal detector to save his life. And, and so he said, my parents babied him after that. They had pity on him. And I told him, I said, I think that was probably the worst thing that could have happened because you, you, had, you were the golden child after that. And you were anything but a golden child, never turned out to be one. And he would say, yes, you're right. We, we, we have that kind of relationship. But I said, I think that hurt you. Because you were not challenged after that. You were babied after that. And let me just say this to you. You don't get better because somebody feels sorry for you. You get better because somebody has faith for you. And if you're looking for sorrow and pity, you will be sorrowful and pitiful the rest of your life. And if somebody's still talking about a problem they had three years ago, they haven't gotten well. Their needle is still pointing east, south, west, but it's not pointing north. Because people who have a north pointing compass are going to talk about God and, 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 and what the devil meant for harm. God turned for good. And I'm, you're going to see the glory of God in this situation. But when people start getting down and want to draw attention to themselves, the needle on the compass starts moving in that selfish direction. And so we have to be careful to not let the crisis get us. Now, there are three stages here. and I'll try to get through these real quickly. Number one is denial. Whenever the compass gets out of sync is when we're in denial. And in other words, I'm okay. You know, how, how often do you ask people, you come up to people and say, how are you, how you doing? I'm okay. They're really not okay, but they don't want to say anything to you. This is the other side of that coin. I'm in denial. And can I say something to you? It's okay to not be okay. Now, when I say that, it doesn't mean you're not true north. It means you're intimately honest, but God. When you come up and say, but God's going to turn it around. I'm really not okay right now, but I'm going to be okay. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be okay. Because extreme faith and extreme faith people would say, never say that. You know, I, when I first started making this transition into the independent church movement, uh, and I was on staff at a really, really large church, great church, wonderful people. But you never called in sick you called in challenged. <laughs> now, I didn't see anything wrong with calling in sick, but you never said that. If you ever said, you know, I, I can't make it today, I'm sick. Oh, no, you're not. You're healed. Well, I, I know I'm going to be healed. I got that. It's my north. But what I'm saying is Jesus himself said in John 16, 33, in the, 33, in the world you have tribulation. Take courage of overcome the world. See, extreme faith and staying north is not being dishonest. It's being honest about what you're going through and trusting God to get you through it. It's, it's like the, the, the father whose son kept throwing himself in the fire, having epileptic fits, and, 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 and he comes to Jesus, and, and he, Jesus asks him what he wants, and he tells him, and, and, and the guy says, if you can, if you can, basically heal my son. And Jesus goes, if I can, like question mark, if I can, well, of course I can. But this man was smart enough to go, I believe, but forgive me for my unbelief. True north is not a religious direction. It is an intimate relationship with God direction that says, 
yes, we're going to have some challenges in the world. We're going to have some struggles in the world, but I'm going to take courage and overcome the struggle. That's true north is admitting and saying I'm not in denial. The second level is fantasy where you fantasize that circumstances are going to change, therefore everything's going to be all right. Everything's not going to be all right because circumstances change. They're going to be all right because you believe in God who changes the circumstances. In other words, I'm, 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 I'm not going to say, okay, it's not happening, and here's what I see happening, and say, here's what I see God doing, not what I see happening. I see God doing something on my behalf. I see God doing it for me. And so when we live in this fantasy world that circumstances are going to change and we'll just keep doing what we're doing, well, insanity is doing the same thing, expecting different results. And so we have to adjust, if you will. Joseph had to adjust. And then it, just when you think it's over, Joseph goes and he has favor everywhere he goes. He's having favor everywhere he goes. And he finds himself uh, working in Potiphar's household and it's a, it's a really upscale job, and as we know, his Potiphar's wife accuses Joseph of coming on to her, and, and Joseph's just out of the pit, man. And then now he's out of the pit. He's sold. His brothers sell him, get rid of him. And now he's doing really good. He has favor. He's in the right place, and then he's falsely accused. You're talking about having a hard time. I think his compass, he had to go, this compass is broke. This is not working. But Joseph maintained a true north attitude. You don't like your boss, stay true north. Don't criticize your boss. Don't talk to other people about your boss. Talk to God about your boss. He's the one that can fix it. Not all everybody around you. God can fix it. And so Joseph finds himself now in prison because of a false accusation. Now, he's in prison. There's chief cupbearer and chief baker in prison with him. So you go from the pit to the prison, and now all of a sudden, these two guys, the chief cupbearer for the king and the chief baker for the king, are in prison. They both have a dream. And, and Joseph, they come to tell Joseph, and Joseph interprets both of their dreams to make a real long story short. One of them, for the chief baker, it wasn't such a good outcome. But, you know, Joseph just told him what was going to happen, and they couldn't quite figure it out. Well, it happened, as Joseph said. And before they went to be with the king, Joseph encourages them, look, tell the king about my situation or tell the king about me. They forget all about Joseph. And it says two years goes by. Folks, two years. So you're in a pit for a season. You're sold. You're in Potiphar's house. You're falsely accused. And now you find yourself in prison, falsely accused, and, and how do you stay true north when you're in two years in prison, wrongfully accused, no proof, nothing, and here you are? You've been trying to get promoted for 10 years. Let's bring this home. You, you've been trying to get your husband to not be an idiot for 20. He's a man. May take 30. But, but you're in this place imprisoned by choices that somebody else made. Maybe you didn't make. Maybe you're just living your life right. And you think, why is this happening to me? You can have that conversation all you want to have it, and it's probably still going to be the same because you don't have the answer. Only God does. And if God has the answer, then you pursue God, not the answer, because the in, answer is inside of God. So Joseph finally gets his chance. The king has a dream. Chief, The chief... Uh, chef, if you will, whatever, the cupcake man, <laughs> the baker is dead. He's impaled. And the dream was that, they, they, you know, anyway, the birds are plucking his eyes out and all. It's real gross. But Joseph then interprets a dream for the king. The king finds out about him, interprets a dream. Why? Because he stayed true north. He kept serving God. There is a thing called a one, it, it's, I'm going to find it here. As you can tell, I'm just going along here. There it is. If you start out one degree off course, after traveling 100 miles, you will be approximately 1.67 miles off course based on the 1 in 60 rule, which states for every degree of course off course, you will be one mile off course for every 60 miles traveled. 
So if you're just one degree off at the start, after 60 miles, that shifts. So if Joseph for a minute gave any attention to how he is mistreated, he would be going away from God instead of toward God. So when we start talking about all the things we don't have, all the pains, all the struggles, how we've been wronged, how people have really messed us over, how bad life is, and we start going down, it's that one degree. In the beginning, okay, you had a moment. But when that moment turns into a movement of mile after mile after mile, you're going to get out here and be so far off course, you can't even see where you were intentionally intended to go. So we can't keep talking about the problem. Some of you all have people in your life, maybe, and we all have people in our lives. I have people in my life that in order for me to stay true north, I don't use their name. We know there's this person. But just to try, and so Joseph finds himself in the palace finally after being thrown in the pit, being put in prison. He finds himself, the, literally the Pharaoh put him in charge of everything. He is in, he's a foreigner in charge of everything. Israel and all the other people, there's this great famine. Some of you have probably read this. And, and, and Joseph's dad told his brothers who had thrown him in the pit and sold him, to go to Egypt and, and go where he was, and long story short, Joseph controlled all the food supply. People are starving. They're going hungry. It's a famine. This is how you know true north, that when he sees his brothers, he broke down and wept. Most of us want revenge. Most of us want to see him pay. And it took a moment, and Joseph did a couple of little funny things there. But at the end of the day, he took care of them. Those who wanted to kill him, those who sold him, those who put him in a pit. Listen, folks, there's never an acceptable time for payback. And every one of us have people we'd love to pay back. But when you get real spiritual and religious, I don't want to pay them back, but I like to be there when they get paid back. No, we all have this twisted thing about Christianity that we can, and once you get to know God, it gets a little tougher because now you might use the scripture in your favor. You twist it just a little bit, tweak it just a little bit. You know, you just get off north a little bit. Well, if you get off north a little bit, 10 years from now, you'll be way off north because you've allowed a seed of anger, bitterness, and revenge to grow in you and it's overshadowing the beauty of God in your life. Yeah, things are tough. We've all lost at various levels. We've all lost things that, that were irretrievable. Can't get them back. And we keep trying to get them back and trying to get it's what I call the Vegas principle. Many people that are, are gambling addicts, they lose money and then they start chasing money. Well, they've already lost it. Now they start chasing it. And instead of saying, I'm done, i got to turn back north, it's like I'm going to keep going deep south. We try to chase what we lost. We never chase what we lost. We're being chased by God. Stop and let him have you. Stop and let him embrace you. Stop and let him heal you. Stop and let him take up and fix you back up and trust him. So very important. Stay true north. As you think about this, just keep remembering when something starts pulling on you, like it did Galatia, the people of Galatia, how crazy are we to think that we can finish the race that Jesus helped us start? And it says, and I close with this, he who began a good work in us will bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. But I have to stay on course. And I have to realize it's not my way, it's his way. And I have to realize that whatever's happened to me, whether I caused it or someone else did, that God, if I will let him and I will stay true north, he will turn that which the enemy meant to destroy me and he'll turn it for good. I'm a better person today after going through hell than I ever would have been without going through it. I don't want to go through it again, never want to, but I'll tell you right now, I wouldn't trade what happened to me for anything because it's made me more intimate with God than I've ever been. And, you know, there are people that, that will always be faces in my mind that I have to pray for. 
And I have to go, God, they're making me better. Making me better. Because I'm going to lean on you harder than you've ever been leaned on by me. Lean on him. Trust in him. Stay true to him because he will always be true to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being a focal point in our lives, the focal point of our lives. God, I pray today that those who are struggling to, to keep north, keep focused on you, would surrender the things that are a distraction to them. Instead of looking for answers, plural, look to you because you have the answer for every one of our difficulties and every challenge in our lives. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I'd like to ask all of you to pray this prayer with me. Just simply pray, Father God, thank you so much for loving me so much that you gave your only son to die on the cross for my sin. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. Today I give my life to you, and I declare you are my true north. Amen. Prayed that prayer for the first time or to recommit your life to Jesus. Please text the word SAVED to the number on the screen, 405-500-1310. Just put SAVED in your name. It will get to the right place. Our prayer team will be praying for you. We will not come after you. We will pray for you. We will lift you up and keep you in, in uh, our prayers. And so please do that right now if you would. This time I want to receive our tithes and offerings. You know, a, a part of true north is staying true to God in every area of our lives, in grace, mercy, forgiveness, all those things. But financially staying true north to God, saying, God, the first 10% of, uh, uh, and it, it goes to you. It's the tithe. It's the first. And uh, it's one way to release heaven. Just like if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. That's what the Bible says. And so when you sow forgiveness, you reap forgiveness. When you sow finances, you reap finances. And and uh, I had a, a p piano player one time in, in, on our team, and he didn't tithe, and he wanted to teach a class, and he said, my tithe is I play piano for free. And I said, that's not a tithe, that's a gift. And I said, your tithe goes to the house of God, not through the gift of man. And so uh, he, he just couldn't grasp it. And to my knowledge, I've never seen any change in his uh, situation. If you want to change in your situation, Go true north and say, God, whatever you have to say in the area of finances and giving, I'm going to obey it. And when you do, trust me, you will not be disappointed. So if you want to do that today, there's a QR code on the screen behind me. Put your smartphone on that and uh, lead you to a giving platform. You can put your debit card or credit card in. It's very simple. Uh, you can also text the word GIVE to 405-546-2226 right there on the screen. It will walk you through that same giving platform. Uh, you can give on your way out. You can give on our website, mosaicokc.church forward slash give. And uh, you can also mail to 5821 Northwest Expressway right here in Oklahoma City, 73132. All right? This time I'm going to ask our prayer partners to come to my left, your right. Listen very carefully. Uh, part of keeping true north in our lives is surrendering to faith and people's prayers. The Bible tells us to pray for one another. And sometimes we get in such a hurry that we, we don't respond to that. And I'm not, this is not a rebuke. This is an exhortation of if you need prayer, you're fighting through something. You think, nah, it'll be fine. I'm embarrassed. I don't want to tell anybody I need prayer. I met with somebody this week, and I said, man, I want, I want to ask you. And he already prays for me. I said, pray for me real carefully by name and real slow and say, you know, go ahead and say Mark Anthony Crow, Mosaic Church, OKC. Let's just make sure no angel gets messed up taking it to God, whatever. I'm just messing with you. But prayer is a very important thing. So if you need prayer, please take the time to go receive prayer. Stand, if you would, please. If this is your first time here, we have a gift for you at the Welcome Kiosk. Please stop by and get it, praying that you have the best week ever. Let's go out with a shout. One, two, three. Hallelujah.